silly season in the Southern Ocean as the bottom of the world becomes a racetrack. We take a look at the quest for records and glory. There's an almighty bang, the, the boat turned hard to starboard, the rudder popped up. Once I managed to get the rudder back down and get the boat sorted out, I realised that the foil had broken, the starboard foil had broken. Plus, in the second part of our World Sailing Show exclusive, the architect of the Modern America's Cup, Russell Coots, gives his vision of the future for the Cup. A new class at the Sailing World Cup final in Melbourne blew everyone away. The Sailing World Show was there to see why. We still haven't yet had the final decision on whether kiteboarding will be in the Tokyo Olympic Games in 2020. But first, it was crunch time in Japan for America's Cup teams. For some, winning the last America's Cup World Series event will provide a serious leg up in the quest for the America's Cup. By the end of 2016, the America's Cup World Series had got serious. After nine events run over 16 months in eight countries, the final battle was for just two points. Bonus points that could be a big advantage on the road to the America's Cup itself. Although winning the last World Series event in Fukuoka, Japan would be good for morale, taking the series was the goal, as it would provide a two-race head start come the qualifiers in May. Next year, teams will switch from the identically matched AC45s to their sophisticated custom race boats. Plus, they will be match racing only. And from early June, teams will start to be eliminated. So 2017 has plenty of unknowns. Hence, starting the year with two big wins in the bag was the focus, especially for Land Rover BAR, who arrived in Japan leading Oracle Team USA by 14 points in the overall standings. A buffer, but certainly not a done deal, placing both skippers under pressure. It's really Ben's to lose, but you know, as we've seen, stranger things are happen, and we'll be doing everything we can to uh, try and take the two points. People talk about the pressure in sport, and you know that's always there. Um, okay, there's more at stake at this event, but I'm really pleased with the way our team, for a new team, has come together and gelled, and we've shown that we can deal with tight situations in previous events. Our approach is to keep being consistent, keep the same processes. That's how you deal with pressure in a sporting environment, and that's our approach. Putting theory into practice, Ainsley's team took the first race with ease, while Spithill languished in fourth. The second race saw a change in fortunes, with Spithill taking second, while Ainsley rescued third from a tricky race in which the team had been last at one stage. The third race of the day saw Spittle take a win, with Ainsley in second. It was clear that a serious match race was underway. I think they were sailing well. You know, I, I don't believe there's any luck in sailing. Super Sunday, the final day of the America's Cup World Series, and where each of the three races counted for double points. The breeze was light, stress levels were high, and Ainsley was protecting his position on two teams in particular as he held up both the American and New Zealand teams at the start. Actually incredibly aggressive move by Land Rover BAR. But this was just the beginning of a head-to-head -head battle between the two teams. So Ben Ainsley has one thing on his mind, and that is just to keep the Americans and the New Zealanders completely out of the picture. A port and starboard incident caused Ainsley to protest, but the umpires declared no penalty. The pair came together once again at the top of the course. This time, Spithill had the upper hand and retained it at the last mark before the finish. And Oracle Team USA holding off the challenge of Sir Ben Ainsley. In the overall stakes, Ainsley still had a 13-point lead. His team could smell victory. Penalty on Land Rover BAR. But it didn't start well with Ainsley over the line at the start, and Spithill was off with the rest of the fleet. But Ainsley was in his classic comeback mode and got back into the mix, before pulling off the move of the regatta on the final leg of the course. Coming into the last mark with more speed than Spithill, and with the rules on his side, he forced the American out of the way to take second.
ambition to secure the America's Cup World Series overall with a race to spare. The coveted two bonus points for 2017 were in the back. In the final race, Land Rover BAR took third, enough to take the event as well as the overall title. They are the champions. It's what we love when it gets aggressive like that. To go into that final race with the overall series sewn up. To be fair, we were trying to get that bonus point off Oracle and uh, make life hard for them. We obviously wanted to leave the World Series with two points, but we've got a point coming out of this. The rest of the team's got nothing, including Team New Zealand, so, you know, that's something. So, what happens next? The road to the America's Cup involves three phases. The first is the qualifiers, a double round robin. Each team races each other twice. The lowest scoring challenger is eliminated. And the defender, Oracle Team USA, plays no further part until the America's Cup itself. The challenger playoffs is a knockout phase. Each match is a first to five series to select the challenger. Then the America's Cup match, a first to seven series. So Fukuoka had marked the end of a key chapter in the 35th America's Cup. But it also denoted the start of the next crucial phase. The road to the Cup had now changed gear, from serious to intense, after a cutthroat battle for just two points. He's the architect of the modern America's Cup. And in the second part of our exclusive interview, Sir Russell Coots describes how sailing's most prestigious event might influence sailing in the future. He believes the future for cup racing might lie with simplifying it. By the time they launch their race boats, some teams will have built five boats for this America's Cup cycle. Everyone recognises it would be much simpler if, if ultimately you gravitated to just using one boat, and that's certainly where the teams want to go in the future. If you could get it such that you were only using one boat and you were developing that one boat all of the time, and that one boat was much more efficient than what the current boats are, then you're really winning, and, and, and that's certainly where, as I said, the teams want to take it in the future. It'll happen. But it's not just the boats that will change. He believes that the sailors themselves will play a big part in reshaping the sport. Old style of cup racing used to come out of Olympics and you pretty much had to relearn a, a new sport to then be qualified to go and race in the America's Cup. With this one you're seeing sailors come straight out of high performance dinghy, straight out of the Olympic Games and within a very short space of time all the skills that they've developed and continue to develop are immediately applicable to this style of racing. Here once again technology will help. Once we start to measure grinding efficiencies and power and show the viewer heart rates. So two of the sailors on board Oracle Team USA in one of the races in San Francisco, heart rates didn't drop below 180 beats per minute the whole 22 minute race. I think there are the sort of things that we need to bring out in, this, in the product yet and we haven't even started to. Or give the viewer information on the wind direction on board each of the yachts so that the viewer actually knows more than the sailors on board the boats and can see the picture changing in front of them. But at the heart of the story are people. I'd challenge anyone to watch a sports product where they don't know one of the athletes, or at least have read or viewed something about them and, and are intrigued by that athlete. I think it enhances that viewer experience and it's what we really need to work on with this product because as I said, people tend to focus on much more on the technology, probably 80% on the technology and 20% on the athletes. And I think we've got to at least balance that up to more like a 50-50 or even a 70-30 towards the athlete. And there is no shortage of candidates. We've got some existing, let's say, sailing stars and some developing sailing stars. If I move the clock forward and, and look two, three years out, I think there's some young sailors out there that'll come into this format and absolutely crush it. And that's exciting too, because I think ultimately the next stage of increasing the popularity is to really focus on the personalities, because I think there are some great competitive elements to it.
During the long winter nights of the Northern Hemisphere, the bottom of the world can be a busy place. Down under, it's summer, where the global racetrack is open. For those looking to win one of the toughest races on Earth, or set new records for a lap of the planet, November is the start of the silly season in the Southern Ocean. At the beginning of the month, 29 single-handed sailors set off on the Vendée Globe Race, a non-stop, unaided race around the world in 60-foot monohulls. For the front runners, the race will take around 80 days. Yet only a few years ago, a lap of the planet in this time was the stuff of fantasy. In the last race, Francois Gabard finished in a shade over 78 days. But there are others on the same global track who were not in the race, but are looking to go even quicker. Thomas Coville is currently attempting to break the solo record aboard his 31-metre trimaran, Sudebo. To succeed, he needs to beat the record of 57 days and 13 hours set by Francis Joyon aboard his 30-metre trimaran, IDEC 2, in 2008. After just 14 days, he was claiming a new record time to the Cape of Good Hope. By day 22, he was claiming another record. By Cape Horn, yet another record. This time for the Pacific. But while his margin provided a comfortable buffer, the route up the Atlantic can be unpredictable. Quand vous l'avez passé, il y a une espèce de soulagement. There's a kind of relief after the anxiety of the ice, being far away, being alone. And also the fact that you know the slightest mistake can be fatal. To beat the record, he has to cross the finishing line off Ushant before Tuesday, January the 3rd. Meanwhile, there's yet another sailor out there who's trying to set a new globe-trotting record that will take him longer than all of the others. Gitan Omura is sailing a 40-foot monohull and is looking to better the current record of 137 days for this size of boat. Meanwhile, in the Vendée Globe, the race has lived up to its fearsome reputation as broken gear takes its toll on the fleet. The first major damage was Alex Thompson aboard Hugo Boss, who broke one of his dagger balls. There was an almighty bang, the, the boat turned hard to starboard, the rudder popped up. Once I managed to get the rudder back down and get the boat sorted out, I realized that the foil had broken, the starboard foil had broken. Then came a string of retirements, including Vincent Rieu aboard PRB, Morgan La Gravière aboard Safran with rudder damage, and third place, Seb Joss aboard Edmond de Rothschild with a broken foil. Then there was a dramatic mid-ocean rescue as Quito de Pavin was forced to abandon his boat after a collision left his keel hanging by just a thread. But among the list of problems and breakdowns came some extraordinary footage from the bottom of the world as a French TV crew filmed Alex Thompson and Armel Lefesh and their high-speed blast through the Southern Ocean. Video evidence that the Southern Ocean's silly season was in full swing. After the break, how a new type of racing stole the show in Melbourne. Plus 2016, a spectacular year afloat. But first, a high-speed collision between two America's Cup boats doesn't bear thinking about. But during one training session, the unthinkable came frighteningly close. Find out how in part two. Scorching around the great sound in Bermuda at speeds well in excess of 30 knots, Oracle Team USA and Artemis were out training, sparring with each other. So uh, we're getting ready to go behind them and then they put their bows and uh, slowed the boat down in a big hurry and we had to make a split second decision about which way to go and you know, luckily those instincts were right. <laughs> we picked the right direction and you know, saved both programs a lot of hassle. In 1956, St Kilda in Melbourne played host to the Olympics. 
Back then, there were five classes and 28 nations taking part from the Royal Melbourne Yacht Squad. 60 years later, plenty has changed since the Games were last in town as the Sailing World Cup finals get underway. There are now 10 Olympic classes and prize money, a total of $200,000 across the fleets. There were 460 boats and 800 competitors representing more than 35 nations. For some, Melbourne was solely about World Cup success. For others, a first step towards the Tokyo Games in 2020. But for those watching, it was a new class that stood out by a mile. Kite order. Today, there's barely a beach in the world that doesn't have a kiteboard screeching back and forth across it. But as its popularity continues to grow, kiteboarding has taken another leap, this time up onto foils. A leap that may see a new discipline added to the Olympic Games. Five-time kiteboarding race champion, Steph Bridge, is among those that are keen to see this happen. And she has a ready-made team that backs her all the way, her family. Of her three sons and a husband that are all kiteboard fanatics, eldest and middle sons, Ollie and Guy, were competing alongside her at the Sailing World Cup event. As a family, it's fantastic because I've got Oliver, our older son, and Guy, our middle son, and it's his first world sailing event. He's never been to anything like this. And here we are halfway around the world, and uh, I've got, at the moment, after day one, Ollie in first and Guy in second, so it's pretty cool. A lot of the other guys here don't have anyone to train with. They're always going out on their own, whereas we have me, Mum, and uh, my brother Guy always on the water, and yeah, it's more motivation, and you can test different equipment and work out who's going best, easy. So to race against and with the boys is really, really fun. It's a constant game of making sure everyone's got the right equipment and, and inevitably you break things. So I end up quite often just giving them my stuff and sitting out or using the wrong kite or something like that. So, um, so for sure it's, it's definitely more of a challenge to have the two boys plus me trying to compete, but uh, we all like challenges. I don't think we're as competitive on the water as it comes across, but yeah, we want to beat each other. But while this is the first time that kiteboarding has officially been included in the Sailing World Cup, it's also a step that could mark a bigger long-term change. In 2012, kiteboarding became an Olympic sport. It got dropped also in that year, six months after it became an Olympic sport. And um, it's been an incredible journey in that not only has it been affiliated with World Sailing, but also it's grown in popularity all over the world. It's recently been accepted to become a youth Olympic sport in 2018. And we still haven't yet had the final decision on whether kiteboarding will be in the Tokyo Olympic Games in 2020. One of the big things is we've moved to the hydrofoil and we're doing incredible speeds and angles on the water. This World Sailing event in Melbourne is, is huge for the sport because we've got the next two months of the final decision being made in becoming an Olympic sport. So this was really important that kiteboarding was represented here in Melbourne. And it was the foils that made the biggest impact. Racing on the same course as the Olympic classes, the foiling boards were able to sail upwind at angles and speeds that have not been possible with conventional kiteboards. And there was one sailor who was particularly good at it. Having led the Melbourne series with ease, Ollie Bridge had a rare crash when he hit weed with his foil and finished fifth in the first of three races. He bounced back, winning race two and three to take gold in the series, while brother Guy took bronze. Aside from the impressive family affair, the spectacle and speed of the new kite foiling generation was the talk of the dockside down under and may yet prove to be a big step forward for the class. So while Melbourne has a 60-year legacy, it was also marking a new step for a new generation of sailors. The 2016 Extreme Sailing Series finale in Sydney saw the battle between the series front runners, Alinghi and Oman Air, go down to the final races. Alinghi applied a clinical approach to the racing, resulting in a win giving them the overall series title. This is the third time that Alinghi has taken the overall trophy. The sailing world lost one of its greatest this month, Paul Elstrom, with four consecutive Olympic gold medals and 11 world titles across seven different types of boat. He was considered by many to be the most accomplished sailor of all time.
but it was his technical input to the racing world that provided such an exceptional contribution to the sport. From the design of the self-bailer, the toe straps and the kicking strap, to sail making and his iconic book on the racing rules, Elvstrom's lifetime's work continues to be a huge influence in sailing. And finally, Rob Greenhouge has won the MS Amlin International Moth Regatta in Bermuda for the second time, taking the $5,000 cash prize. Fellow British sailor Dylan Fletcher Scott had pushed Greenhouge to the final races of the regatta, but couldn't better the match racing tactics of Greenhouge. Next month, did the man seeking to be the fastest around the world make it? We report on Thomas Povell's incredible solo circumnavigation. Why ice yachting is cool. Plus the classic Rolex Sydney Hobart yacht race. 